Well, um, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about a lot of things, but a simple out-of-body exercise or technique that can be practiced by um, basically anyone. Now, I I know my videos kind of wander around sometimes in different parts, but I'm going to start with the exercise and then I'll go from there. I know some of you are eager to, to try this sort of thing. Some of you have had it, your own experiences. Um, a lot of you have. This exercise is very simple. Now, this is not astral projection. This is um, out-of-body soul projection or Tuza or soul travel. And um, so we're not attempting to separate the astral body and then look at the physical body. Very, very simple, basic exercise. But it's, don't underestimate the power of this exercise. And I'll talk about that a little later. Um, even though it may appear very simple and basic, um, sometimes it's a fundamental. And it can lead to a lot of other experiences, which are really profound so it's sort of a it's sort of a can opener you get the can open once the can's open then you can have you can start preparing the meal um okay in this exercise what you do is you sit down if that's possible i mean you could do it laying down but in this case we'll we'll do it as if you sit down in a comfortable chair you know preferably a quiet environment and you can do this um Actually, you can do this almost anywhere, but it's, it's especially when you're first starting out, do it in a quiet area if you can. It, it's good if you can turn off your cell phone or any kind of thing that's going to interf interfere with it. It could, This exercise can be done very in a short period of time. Um, so you close your eyes and you take six deep breaths. Now you could do seven deep breaths, but, but the main thing is you count them. Very slowly, get plenty of air in your lungs. I mean, not too much, but just a, whatever feels comfortable. And you close your eyes and you place your attention upon the tis retil, which is the third eye, known as the third eye. It's between the eyebrows. And don't worry too much about it. And you take these five breaths. And then you begin to chant the word hue. And you pronounce the H and then U. And I'll demonstrate that. So you take your six or seven deep breaths, counting each one. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and then you chant. He H U. H U Now at this point and you and you draw this out and you do this about um let's just make it seven times uh, six times we'll do it six times you do this six times and now what you're going to do is you are going to place your attention about six feet behind your head and jump out of the body so that you're looking from behind your head. So now you're looking at the back of your head. Now at, the, at that point, you've left your body. Now you might think it's just your imagination. It might be very subtle. It's probably not going to be like a movie or a dream it's probably going to be rather subtle so you have to pay attention this is one of the problems that people face when they do this sort of work is that they want technicolor hollywood special effects or they want to have it like as in a dream and these things do happen people do have those types of experiences where it's very vivid and very um sensory or very um knock your socks off type of things and it's not subtle, and these things do happen, but most of the time, it doesn't quite work like that. It's it's like sensitivity. I mean, I, I, sometimes I give bad examples, I try, but as an example, you know, um, 
if you're used to going into a, a rock concert where they blast the, they have like a huge mega sound system with thousands of watts going through dozens and dozens of speakers at a big concert. If you're used to that level of sound, that loudness, and then you go into a concert where there's, let's say, a single flautist or flutist, and, and they're in an acoustic environment with no sound system, and you're not sitting right next to the person, uh, or somebody playing a um, musical instrument like an oboe or um, a cello or something, you're not going to get that kind of volume, that knock your socks off volume. And, and, and sometimes, you know, you may even be at a distance. So it's like you have to listen more closely. It's more refined. And so when you jump out of your body or put your attention behind the body, the physical body, you will see um, the back of your head. Now, whether you think it's your imagination or not, don't, my all, my suggestion is always when doing these exercises is, um, this is a very basic exercise. When doing these exercises, um, <clears throat> save your analytical judgment for later. You know, there's a lot of people that are very mental and very analytical, and that's fine. Um, I don't have a problem with that. We don't have a problem with that in Vardenkar to an extent, but there comes a point where it gets ridiculous. When it gets, the ridiculousness is when the individual is is um, evaluating and, and trying to figure it out so blow by blow with each each thing they experience. They're going back and saying, "Is that real?" Is it, you know, they're so addicted to a- analyzing and, and mentalizing that they can't stop. Even they can't even suspend it for 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 a, a minute or two or three or four or five. That's that's when it, it it's controlling the individual. They becoming so fixated on analyzing and, and every experience, every note, every um, image is is getting analyzed the second it, it, it so it, it kind of kills it. It's like taking a, it's like, cr- you know, putting a, cr- you know, growing a seed and as just as it barely starts to come out of the surface and you see a little tiny green thing, like pounding it with your heel into the ground, you know, and saying it never grows. Well, no, it doesn't grow because you keep pounding into the, into the dirt. So, so um, for example, if you see some kind of an image, um, it's important to have, if possible, attitude is very important. Um, a lot of the people that fail in these types of exercises, they have a really bad attitude. They don't realize it, but they're very, very skeptical to the point where anything that, that happens... They, they dismiss it as being their imagination, or it's not real, or it's an hallucination, or it's auto-suggestion. They've got all these scientific reasons. They're usually terrified of leaving their body, and so they have all these excuses. But Or they're extremely mental. Now, like I said, there are different levels of that. Um, but to be honest with you, if you even if you are mental or you're, you have a very developed mind or intellect... One has to be careful because we've been fed all this misinformation by the metaphysicians and religionists and all these people. So getting back to the exercise, um, so we're basically projecting behind the head and viewing the body. So we now are aware that we've left the body. Now children do this type of thing all the time. Actually, they they are more advanced than this. Um, you know, they'll they'll be sitting in in school. And, and the teacher will be going on and on about something they really already know, or maybe it's just not interesting to them. And they'll be off, you know, slaying dragons and and uh, and having all kinds of fun or whatever they're doing, um, talking to robots, building robots, or whatever it is they're doing. They're certainly having more fun than the teachers providing. In some cases, I'm not putting down teachers. Oh, it's a unappreciated profession that deserves more respect uh in some cases some of it can be brainwashing or bordering on brainwashing so it depends on the school the teacher and the situation but what i'm saying is that we've been brainwashed we've been inundated with all this false information and and dogma and superstition and these um various religious religions and metaphysical metaphysical um theories and, and books and 
and gurus and all this stuff. And most of it's not even true. <laughs> you see, a whole reality system is is based on 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 illusion and lies and these things become manifest so we actually create this and so then we we can argue well which comes first the chicken or the egg you know if if i manifest it then isn't it real well y yes in and no and this is the nature of the lower worlds the worlds of time and space is we have this unceasing um unlimited not almost unlimited amount of paradoxes see I say one thing and you can argue with me. I say the same thing you say, you can argue with me the other way. Um, this is because of the nature of the lower worlds. We have the duality. We have the, the positive and the negative. We have the mountains and the valleys, the love and the hate, the light and the dark. You see, that's the, the nature of the mind and the nature of the lower worlds is that of duality, pain and pleasure, um, light and dark, etc., etc. So... Any statement that one makes can be argued either way, and that's the problem with the mind. It's like a dog chasing its tail. So what we're doing here now is we're gaining experience. You know, rather than book knowledge, or, or book knowledge is fine to an extent, um, in the fact that it can provide instruction. It can provide the methodology, the methods of... of, of doing these things such as leaving the body to in order to gain the actual experiences you see when we gain these experiences what what are we really gaining we're gaining access to this consciousness it's all about consciousness it's all about vibration and then we get into the, this light and sound of god or the or the hure we call it the hure in vardenkar and this is the thing this is the the thing that this is the the wave that comes from the heart of God, the ocean of love and mercy, and it goes down, down, down into the various planes or worlds, the God worlds. It goes down, down in vibration until finally it gets so low that it has to break up into this duality, you see. And then we reach the, the psychic worlds, you know, the etheric world, the mental world, the causal, the astral, etc. Now, this is probably... A, this is not the best lecture for an introduction to Vardenkar because I'm not covering it in a lot of detail, but we're getting back to this whole this whole exercise, you see, and having having the experience. So I kind of look at this exercise, very simple, very basic. It's, it's sort of a, I won't say a beginner's exercise, but it's, I like to think of it as you, let's say you have a bolt and it's rusted onto a car or it's rusted onto a machine and you got to somehow unseize the bolt. The bolt is seized. It's it's rusted on there. You know, sometimes you got to put a monkey wrench on there and you just got to whack it with a hammer, you know. It's it's crude, but it loosens the bolt. Once the bolt's loose, you put a little oil on it and you can get it off, you see. But it's that initial kind of whacking it with a hammer, getting it so that it's no longer seized. It's no longer glued or frozen. And so it can start to turn. It can start to un... And then all of a sudden, hey, it's working. We, we can get the bolt off. We can we can open up the, the machine or we can fix whatever needs to be fixed. This rusted bolt is now free. It's moving again. You see, so we put a little oil and we, we got to whack it and maybe use some kind of chemical or, or just hit it without trying to, <laughs> to break it. And so this exercise is kind of like getting getting things going. You see, we're constantly leaving our body. We're just not aware of it. So this brings it into another focus. So all of a sudden, so we're, we're looking behind our head at our physical body. And then people say, well, now what? Well, that's the whole thing is now we can get into these more advanced exercises where we're actually meeting with masters, um, Varden masters, we're going to golden wisdom temples on the various planes, and then we start being introduced. Um, it's we really already probably know them if we're at this stage, but we start getting introduced to some of these masters like Fubi Quants, who has a, a monastery and a golden wisdom temple. Um, we start to 
meet masters um, like Yabal Sakabi. And these masters are, are really beings that are that are rather old in the sense of the soul is timeless, but they're old in, in the fact that they've kept, they kept the same body for quite a while. But that's not really important as much as it is their consciousness. See, their consciousness is what we're after, not not the longevity. Um, there are beings, there are people that, that are very old, older than, than you probably believe, but that doesn't make them spiritual, you see. And this is the psychic versus the spiritual. People don't really understand this. So, But you start to, you're able to, to begin to do things, but it takes a tremendous amount of, of humility, you see. That's the that's the key thing here is when we ask God, when we say to God, "Let me, I'm going to do it my way. I'm gonna, I'm going to find you, but I'm going to do it in my own way." You know, damn it, I'm going to, I'm going to do this my way, um, or the highway. I'm, I'm going to tell you what I need and when I need it, and my path. It's my path, and I'm going to find you th- through my own, um, my own cognizance and i'm gonna tell you how i'm gonna find you when we have that attitude it's a very bad attitude if you think about it for a moment you know telling spirit telling god how we're gonna find it (laughs) you know i mean we can pick our own i guess it comes down to the whole thing about life is hard for those that pick and choose and this is really something that's mirrored in, in all of life, if you really analyze it a little bit. I mean, if if you wanted to be a doctor and you went to medical school, not that I'm promoting medical school, but if you went to medical school and you wanted to be a doctor, um, can you imagine if you told your professors, well, you know, I don't want to learn about uh, the liver. <laughs> I'm not interested in the liver at all. In fact, I'm, I'm going to skip your liver Classes are talking about the liver. I'm not interested in the liver. I'm interested in the heart. I'll come back in a week when you talk about the heart. Bye. I'm going to go off on vacation. I'm going to read about the heart. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't. You wouldn't make it. You see, because they're all they're, You can't take part of the program and ditch the rest of it. You can't take part of the truth and say, well, you know, I'll. I'll do this, but I'm not, I don't need a master. I don't need to go to these wisdom temples. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to read the books that I want to read, and I'm going to go back to God in my way. Well, you can do that. You, you can try, at least. You see. But this is what, you know, most people don't even try to, to do anything at all, except if follow a dogmatic system, a belief system, which is where they're at. This is the Varden card is not for the masses. But this whole attitude of, I'm going to do it my way, I'm going to pick and choose what I want to believe and what I don't want to believe, and I'm going to pick and choose what methods I use and what methods I don't use. Well, we could do that to an extent, and we should do it to some extent. We have to use common sense here. But we're basically, that's why they call the path the razor's edge. Too far to the left or too far to the right, and, and, and this is the problem is we're walking this middle path. It's very narrow. And each individual has their own path, which is true. But it really depends on what your goals are. If your goal is if your goals are self-realization and God realization, then you certainly um are in the minority because most people aren't interested in God. They're interested in a space god, a god that will provide them with with whatever they think they need to be provided with, uh, you know, safety, health, wealth, happiness, emotional comfort, euphoria, all, all the, the goodies, uh, the materialistic goodies and emotional goodies, astral goodies that pe- the people want, and even the mental goodies, the, the, the intellectual pursuit can become like a drug. It can become the... Um, these things are traps. They're, 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 the lower worlds are filled with illusion. And some of it is quite pleasant. In fact, some of it is... you could Some people would say spectacular. Very, very uh, exciting and interesting and engaging. 
because it does go fairly high in in terms of the lower worlds. But then when you compare it to the higher worlds, there's no comparison. When you get into the pure positive God worlds, which frankly very few people reach consciously, or, or even very few people reach this, thou are getting into the true homes, the true home of soul. This is the higher worlds. You start talking about the soul plane or the Atma Lok, you know, the fifth plane, uh, the sixth plane, the seventh plane. And now you're talking about the pure positive God worlds. There's no lang longer any matter, energy, time, and space. And this is what our goal is in Vardenkar, is to reach these planes. And when we reach the fifth, we, be we begin the process of self-realization. Self-realization has nothing to do with understanding what kind of food you like to eat or what what your calling is in life or what you think you think about this or that or or, or how what your personality is like your lower bodies um it's not it's not knowing yourself as a little self that's not self-realization people will call it that but that's not what it is self-realization has nothing to do really with the lower bodies and the little self and the personality and or even the the past life incarnations and, and embodiments that we've all been through, you uh, generally millions upon millions of them. Most of us don't remember. Um, I do remember quite a few of them, more than I probably would like to remember. You see, so I I know myself what I'm what I'm talking about because I've had the experience, and the same should be hold with you. We've had too many experiences where we're we're brought up to worship a master or, or a guru or a teacher, a dead teacher, a dead master, a dead god man, you know, why? It's the it's this control factor. It's the people want to to set up a god that they can worship that will do things for them. It's the whole father figure or the king figure, you know, the fa the, the son, the prodigal son, um approaches his father and he's basically just like nowadays only maybe a little more dignified and he's like dad can i borrow the car or or, or dad i i want to make so good in my life i would like some land i would like i would like i would like some land i would like a lot of land i'd like to manage part of the kingdom can i please have some land and, and, and a title I mean, could you maybe give me something, please, Dad. You know, <laughs> and then you know, if the son was in in good with the king, the king would be like, "Well, son, you know, you are becoming wiser, and uh, you know, perhaps uh, I can give you some land in this area, and you can, uh, you know, whatever. You know, it's just like, you know, I'll give you so many gold pieces and some land here and a house and." and servants, and all this, and he's like, gee, thank you, thank you, Father, you're so wise, you're so wonderful, I love you, I love you, you know, kiss the hand, um, well, you know, we've all seen that, but now, what about God, is God our servant, you know, who's the servant of who here, is the prodigal son that's coming to God, saying, give me this, and please give me that, and you're so wonderful, could you give me this too, while you're at it, is, is is isn't he trying to use this this father as as a servant to to deliver the goodies that, that he wants? I'm, I know I'm going too on too long about this, but the point is these people that are looking for this. I mean, it's human nature. I understand it, but are they really looking for God? No, not really. This isn't God. God is not a man. Um, you see, the Hure, which that's the name in, for, for God, the highest God, exists in these pure positive God worlds beyond time and space. It's neither male nor female. This is the true worlds where soul exists. In particular, the ocean of love and mercy, the twelfth plane and above. And, and there's no limit to this. This is the true kingdom of God. The lower worlds are basically a school. In fact, you could even go so far as to say they're a prison system. They're a system where souls learn so that one day they can become conscious co-workers and work with God. So getting back to the exercise, um, 
you can see how it, it's it's the beginning. It's like putting the can opener into the can and beginning to to open it up. Um, so once you're out of the body and you're looking at the back of your head, you have several options. You can you can move about the room. You can go above the um, through the ceiling since there's you know you really can do whatever you want to a, to a degree. But you can look down. You can go into space. You can move around within the the orbit of where you're at, the physical astral. Um, or you can make, you know, you can work on the next stages of exercises where you, you connect with these masters. Now you can, you can chant certain holy names for God and, and these masters and wisdom temples, which is, a, can be very effective, um, because you're dealing with the sound current, this, the audible life stream. You see this, this is what sustains all of life. And it moves down from the higher worlds through into different vibratory rates into the into the various planes, and it goes down until it finally splits. And so now you can tune into that. You can chant these various words. Now we started with in the exercise we were chanting H U or HU. It can be done either way. It can be H U. Or you can chant it. Now it's important to to not manipulate this force or try to manipulate the Varden, but rather um, be detached and, and, and allow it um, to, to grant it this this unconditional love and, and gratitude because you're, you're truly in the presence of god well it's, it's spirit but time and space is an illusion but we have to become aware of who or more accurately what we really are because none of these lower bodies including the body that we're now looking at from, from behind the head, the physical body, none of these bodies are us. They're all temporal. There's nothing eternal about the lower worlds. Only soul is eternal. Only soul, our true self, is, is a spark of God. So now soul itself has a 360 degree viewpoint and it knows through direct perception. You see, it, it doesn't have a mind. Soul itself does not need a mind when it's in its true glory, when it's in its true worlds. When it when when soul is in the soul plane and above, there is no mind. There's no astral body. There's none of this. Soul is unimpeded. You see, it's got a three hundred sixty degree viewpoint, and it's it it's engaged in seeing, knowing, and being. You know, I I am, therefore I am. This is at the level where we, we, we start to touch into, we move into self-realization on the soul plane or the Atma Lok. And that's just the beginning of the, of the true journey from the fifth plane up. We, we're not even talking about anything. Well, it keeps going. And, and there's, so it's it's quite, there's quite a bit of, of um, excitement and some people have a lot of fear over this. Because they think they're going to lose their themselves. They think they're going to be absorbed into God. And it's a terrifying thought. But it's not true. Um, soul also maintains its, its individuality. And so soul is the only part that's eternal. It's the only part of us that God really um, cares about. Soul exists because God loves it. This is the law of love. So now, so anyway, getting back to the exercise, one of the things that helps with the exercise, and I should have mentioned this, I apologize. Um, before you do the exercise, sometimes it's really good to study the room, to get a feel for the layout of the room, so that when you jump out of the body and you're looking behind the head, it just makes it easier. 
Now, when, when this occurs, when you jump out of your body and you're looking at the back of your head, like I said, you, you may have this initial reaction. Some people might have an actual, oh, it's my imagination. I'm not really looking at the back of my head. I'm just imagining I'm looking at the back of my head. And so you have to be careful that you don't, that you don't end up analyzing it to death, like stepping on the plant or you know, shooting it down before it has a chance to, to, to expand. You see, because really, even imagination is cut out of the cloth of God. You see, we're taught in school that imagination isn't real, that that these things aren't real. That the only thing that's real is is a, a kick in the pants, you know, <laughs> a, a hammer on the thumb that hurts. That's real, you know. Everything else, you know, and and this is a control factor that's that's foisted on on, on the people in order to keep keep them under control. A little bit like the the movie The Matrix, the original uh, first film. You know, there's this control factor. I'm not saying the film is accurate at all, but I'm saying it's it's an interesting allegory or or, or fable. It's an interesting uh, metaphor. You know, and there's and there's some truth to it. There's some truth to this idea, and so in a sense. We are often used as batteries by, by the system. And I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to get political. I will say that that this leaving of the body is, is very liberating. It can be very liberating. But now you still have to deal with these lower worlds. You see, getting out of the body and looking from behind the head is, the, is just the beginning. But it's an exciting beginning because now the bolt is unseized, you see. Now, it's very important to uh, to have a spiritual master. A master can only take you as far as that master has gone himself. So if you have a teacher who's only able to go up to the astral plane or the causal plane, that's as far as you'll be able to, to move under, under that master. Now, the reason it... You can do it without a master, but it saves a tremendous amount of wear and tear on you um, because there's so many um, pitfalls and rocks and shoals on the path. There's so many dangers because you're dealing with the lower worlds, which are this mixture of positive and negative. You start getting, like, for example, into the astral plane and you're dealing with some of the like lower parts of the astral plane and people start talking about the paranormal and they start talking about these different entities and beings and and all of this stuff with dimensions the new age movement likes to talk a lot about dimensions i don't want you to confuse the planes with dimensions by the way i should say i'm sure, pretty sure the video probably is showing if you're listening to a video watching a video is probably showing the god worlds chart but um there's a god worlds chart varden card god worlds chart you can go to www dot vardencar.com that's v-a-r-d-a-n-k-a-r.com and you'll see this god world's chart which shows the planes you know and, it, and it's numbered one through twelve and there's more than twelve but um and it'll show like the physical astro causal mental is the fourth uh the etheric and then the fifth plane the soul plane the etheric is the top of the mental plane it's the highest part of the mind the very edge of the mind. And we go through the void and into the soul plane. The void is actually just a dark region with a lot of energy, which is often confused for, for God realization. In fact, a lot of these different zones are confused for God realization and or self realization. So there's a lot of um, problems with terminology from different groups that don't connect. They're, they're not, somebody will say soul, and what they really mean is the astral body, but they don't realize that they're talking about the astral body. They think they're talking about soul. Um, or somebody will talk about the, the eighth dimension, and you look at the chart, you say, oh, wow, they're talking about the hookah cutlock and the eighth plane. But no, that's not what they're talking about. They've assigned it a number, the eighth dimension, but they're actually talking about part of the astral plane, or they're talking about something else, you see. So that creates a lot of confusion. And um, so you'll find that. So 
I guess there's, I don't really know what else to say. This is sort of a, a beginner's lecture in some ways, but you can try this technique. Oh yeah, the importance of the master, it saves a lot of wear and tear because there's so many um, pitfalls to, to, to get from point A to point B. It really depends on what you want, but going doing this type of work for recreation or, or just for fun is 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 probably is not a good idea um you're almost better you're probably better off if you're just going to do it because it's fun or you think it's cool you're probably better off just getting some kind of conventional religion like catholicism or lutheran lutheranism or buddhism and and just following what the masses do because you start playing around with this stuff without a master without knowing what you're doing and, and sometimes you find you're playing with fire. So one has to be careful, especially if they're going to get into the psychic. You see, um, see that that's where it, it gets tricky. Because just like in the physical world, you know, these the astral plane, especially the lower parts of the astral plane, it's like, um, it's like going into a major city. You see, there's all these beings and entities. And not all of them are... are, 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 are mean well and some of them and even if they do mean well it, it it can really cause psychological problems emotional problems all kinds of things we also dealing you know with opening up things like opening up the kundalini a lot of people are playing around with this energy they they know nothing about it you see i i just got a um correspondence from someone who was working with the with this energy and now you know, she was forced to stop because it was completely wrecking havoc on her life. It was destroying her. I mean, I, I, maybe I'm exaggerating, but it was... It was a, Anyway, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it but because it's, a, it's private communication, but the point is that, that this was ruining this woman's life and or, or almost did. She had to stop it and, and then she's looking for help. You see, she's looking for help because it wasn't the answer. And 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 this this um there's so many dangers out there in the occult and the psychic, and we, and we don't practice the occult and the psychic. It, we learn certain things, you know. We have experiences, but it's for a purpose. You see, it's it's like traveling. If we're, if we're driving from New York to California, if we have a goal, we have a map, and we know what we want, and we want to settle for nothing less than self-realization, or the fifth plane, but preferably God-realization, maybe mastership, if we can if we can reach that point. Um, although, although if you do, it's not, it's simply be, because it takes a tremendous amount of work, and a tremendous amount of Commitment and it's difficult. It's a difficult path. Vardenkar is not the easiest path. It's the most difficult path, but it's also the most direct because the other method is to go through these various lifetimes, and there are millions of them, through the wheel of 84, where someone goes through the, the zodiac and goes around and around on this wheel, experiencing all number of things, uh, incarnations on various planets, um, male, female, you name it. Um, all these embodiments, embodiment after embodiment, and we even do this on, on some of the planes, like the astral. And so Saul has this enormous amount of experiences, and that's the slow way back to God. Very, very slow. Millions of incarnations. It's a difficult It's a difficult path in its own way, but when the individual gets into Varnankar, then they are able to work out their earthly karma in, in a very short period of time. Um, but it's not easy. The person really, the individual really has to get out of the way and let spirit do its work. And that's not easy because this little self, this ego self, wants to throw a tantrum or have a little hissy fit because it doesn't like it. It's scared. It's like a child. It's like a little child, but God does not care about it because the ego self, the little self, it's necessary in the lower worlds. We have to have it. But it's not eternal. 
You see, the Hure or God only cares about the eternal. Because soul is 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 part of it, you see. Soul is the only part that is of the Hure. It is it is eternal consciousness. It is eternal beingness. You see, we are extremely powerful. As soul, we are extremely powerful. We are we have all the qualities, the, the love, the wisdom, the power, the freedom. Most people don't even understand what love is. They think it's karma. They think it's karmic connections. Karmic binds are mistaken for love. I suppose you could argue that it is love, but it really, when you start to experience these higher worlds, these higher planes, you start to experience uh, soul and these masters at the higher levels, higher vibration, you begin to realize how little there is in the lower worlds. Creation is finished in the lower worlds. And you wonder, why the heck did I want to stay so long? <laughs> what was I afraid of? What was I thinking? Of course, you know, when you get into these higher planes, you're beyond thought. Now, there is this dual awareness. And this is an important part of this, segue into this. This dual awareness is where our attention is split, which is, which is okay, and so we may be, part of us might be looking, be, and I'm giving this back to this exercise I gave, part of us might be looking behind our head, you know, we're out of the body, and a part of us is aware that we're in the body, you see. See, soul doesn't recognize time and space, and all of this is is the splitting of attention. You see, it's a, it's a natural phenomenon. And a lot of times people make the mistake of saying, oh, well, I wasn't really looking at the back of my head because I was in my body because I could feel I could feel an itch on my right leg. That proves I wasn't outside of my body. If I was outside my body, I wouldn't feel the itch or I wouldn't be aware of my breathing. So the whole thing didn't work. Well, this simply is not true. And so we have to realize that we're constantly shifting our attention. Now, sometimes... We can put 100% of our attention or most of our attention um, on the experience. And sometimes we can only put part of it on the experience. But that doesn't really determine the the experience. It's like kind of like an, an analogy would be going to a party and you're having a conversation with somebody. Well, while you're having the conversation, there's a lot of, let's say there's a lot of, in the example, there's a lot of noises going on. Maybe there's some music playing. There's other people talking. Let's say there's a man next to you that's talking and he's rather loud. You see, and let's say you're talking to somebody who's soft-spoken. Okay, so technically the volume of the individual you're speaking with is, is rather on the soft side. And the volume of the music and the people around the person you're speaking with is rather on the high side. So volume-wise, the person that's speaking to you that you're interested in listening to is being blown out of the water by, by all of these noises and, and music and other conversations which you're not really interested in. So what do you do? Well, if the person, usually a lot of times you you're able to understand everything they're saying. How is this possible? Because you're listening, you're focusing your attention, you see, you're not, it's not about, just about volume and intensity, it's about attention. You're able to focus your attention on the soft-spoken individual who's speaking with you, and you're able to filter out or ignore a large percentage of the music and the other conversations, you see? And, and this is what we're doing. We're constantly balancing our attention and focus, and we, do, we can do this automatically. We don't have to... We don't have to consciously think about it. It's a matter of what you're interested in. That's all it really comes down to. If you're if you meet somebody of the opposite sex, or 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 you meet somebody who, for whatever reason, you're fascinated with this person, and you want and you're hanging on their every word, then you're automatically going to put your attention on that person, and everything around you is going to sort of go down and just dis almost disappear. If on the other hand you're totally bored with this person and they're speaking at a very low volume, you're going to have a lot of trouble understanding them because you don't, frankly, don't really want to. I'm sorry, I can't understand you. It's really loud in here. I got to go. <laughs> you know, exit strategy. So, um, and this comes back to the factor of love. H how much do we love God? 
Do we love God because we think God's going to give us a bunch of stuff? That's not really love, you see. You see, that's not really love. So, Vardenkar is for those that desire to have these, to have, to return back to God, to the Hure, and actually experience it. Because ultimately, I can talk to my blue in the face, and you can listen to, to your your ears hurt, and um, you can read until your eyes hurt, and you can read all kinds of books, and you can do all kinds of things, and you can do the hokey pokey, and jump on one leg, and, and dance, and all this stuff, trying to find God. But it's not going to do you a whole lot of good unless you have the, you have to have the experience, you see. Talking and theorizing and reading and, 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 and thinking and feeling and all this stuff are fine. But there comes a point where, you know, why? Vardenkar is not a philosophy. It's not a religion. It's not a metaphysical system. It's a science. It's the ancient science of out-of-body soul projection or soul travel, or Tusa travel, whatever you want to to call it, it's simply understanding that we, we must move our consciousness, our attention, into these higher planes, that the, these planes do not descend down to our, the human state. They're incompatible with one another. Now, once we're able to put our... our um, have these higher realizations, which will come in, in time, um, through these exercises and other and other methods. Once we're able to have these higher realizations, then it's a whole other ball of wax. You see, now now we're beginning to touch the very hem of of God's rope. Not that God has a rope; it's it's meta, metaphoric, of course. See, so it's all it's all about gaining the experience, but then once we gain the experience and we partake of this audible life stream, which contains the sum total of all love, wisdom, and power and freedom, you see, we're, we're so much more than even that. God is so much more than even that. There is no way to quantify this. There's no way to qualify it. There's no, no words that can describe it. It has to be experienced. There's no way around that. You know, my experiences, somebody else's experiences, you know, Heather G's experiences, she's a master. Um, none of this does, you know, you any good. I mean, it helps in the sense that it can maybe maybe encourage you, but but there there's no point in, it's actually negative to worship a personality or to worship, to, to try to live vicariously off of somebody else's experiences. Because whatever experiences they write about, the right the reading of the experience is not the same as the experience. It has to be experienced. And you're gonna have your own experiences and they're gonna be different. They may be greater than what I've had. You see, that's the thing. Who am I to say? Who are you to say? Who are we to judge ourselves or others? You see. God does not judge us in the same way that humans judge each other. God does not care whether you you have a man that's lying in the gutter with a bottle of bourbon in a paper bag with no home, no money, who's homeless. God doesn't di differentiate. You see, that man could be a great soul. Perhaps he's drinking because he's in such pain. Because he knows what he's missing. He's lost his way. But he's this great soul. And he may find God realization. He may find truth. He may find mastership in that life. But he looks like this homely beggar. This drunk. So who are we to judge this man? He may be a great, great soul amongst us. A brilliant light to the world. Who's a, who is on the verge whether this lifetime or the next lifetime or the next, on the verge of becoming a great beacon for, for all, of, all of humanity and, and all the worlds of God. And we have another man who's pious and he's a priest or a minister or some religious guru or, or somebody that's going around feeding homeless children, uh, feeding children, clothing children, educating children, helping people, helping people constantly, nonstop, 
he may he may be a relatively young soul. You see, he may be doing it on a social obligation. He may he may mean well. But you see, God doesn't look at it the way humans look at things. So who are we to judge ourselves? We may be a very bright person mentally, or we may think we're dull. We may have trouble understanding certain things, certain principles, certain ideas. Does that have any bearing on on our on us as soul? No, it is it, it is all about consciousness and it's about humility. Because we of ourselves can do nothing. It is only the Varden or spirit moving through us that does the great works. And I say this again and again with me, with anyone. When we are willing and and willing to surrender and we're willing to get out of the way, to let the little self get out of the way, then true miracles are possible. And when I say miracles, I'm not talking about turning water into wine. I'm not talking about making lots of money. I'm not talking about healing the sick. Although those things are certainly fine, well, at least the healing of the sick, t- t- if, if they have permission. But no, I'm talking about something far greater. You see? And, and we are not Christians, but Jesus tried to talk about this. And so few understood, what is he talking about? You know, he said, follow me. They didn't know what he was talking about. Follow you where? We're following you. We're walking down the street. We're walking down the path with you. You know, what do you mean follow? Um, they didn't really understand the man, but he 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 studied Vardenkar. It wasn't called Vardenkar back then. This path has had many different names. It's always been the ancient science of out of body projection or project soul projection. It's had many, many different names and many, many different masters and faces and different guises. And most of the time when it comes out, it it's not um it's not public. Here we have a, a period of time where the living Varden Master, who's myself in this case, I'm just an embodiment. That's all I am is an embodiment. You know, look at him, look at him. It doesn't matter. This is a temporary position. I will be out of here, not probably not much longer, and then somebody hopefully will replace me. Otherwise, the whole thing goes underground, and people have to do it in the dream state, which has been the way it has been, and they have to do it on the inner, and it becomes more difficult to 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 reach in a lot of cases, um, more selective, and this is the way it usually is. But see, people are so inundated. So people, you, you really have to choose whether you want to be a channel for the cow or you want to be a channel for the Varden. And the cow, as I've said in, in previous talks, has two faces. It has the positive face and the negative face. Two sides of the coin. And the positive face is is, is all about love and, and, and do-gooding and making the world a better place and being kind and considerate and all of these qualities and then the negative face is we we see that all the time is war and killing and murder and 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 and, and sickness and illness and all of these these um destruction and death and these are the two sides of the cow and people flip back and forth and back and forth but Vardenkar is the middle path you see it's the path of of total awareness and this can't be achieved through books. It cannot be achieved through books or listening to this talks like this. You're not going to find it in any text or paper or audio talks or videos on YouTube or any other um, source that's physical. All you're going to find is a path or a way to whatever state of consciousness it leads to. And this will be limited by the leader, and this will be limited by the instructions that are given. And people don't understand this. They really don't. They don't understand what they're dealing with here. Most people are not even aware of anything beyond the astral. And there are different regions of the astral. The low astral, the mid astral, the high astral. There's all kinds of different areas within the astral states. Just like there are different 
radio stations on the on the AM dial, the AM radio dial, or the FM radio dial. They're just different vibrations, different awarenesses, and souls create these, and they and they're ready-made states of consciousness, and they experience them. And this is the confusion. So anyway, this talk is, I've said, I think everything I need to say in the talk. And I, I thank you very much. Try the exercise if you would like. And um, thank you. Thank you for listening. May the blessings be. Baraka Bashad.